Um, I was here two years ago while not in this room. Uh, kernel recipes was still in the previous location. And I was already talking about graphics at that time, and lots of things have changed. So I'm quite happy today uh, to be in front of you again and be able to present all the, all the changes, all the great modifications we've made in graphics subsystem in Linux. Uh, I would like, first of all, I've split my presentation in two parts. So the first one is a bit of an overview of the concept that will be needed to understand the second part. And I would like to know who in the audience is, um, knows about, the, is familiar with the kernel KMS API and the concepts behind it. Okay. No, that's good because I was really wondering if I would bore you with the first part, but if nobody is, uh, is familiar to do with that, it's, it's quite good. So <clears throat> we have this API in the Linux kernel, kernel called DRM KMS. Um, it's a bit confusing because there's two terms, uh, and that's actually two separate APIs that are always referred as a single one. Drivers that implement DRM and KMS are seen a graphics driver. The DRM side, which is the historical uh, graphics API that has been implemented there, uh, DRM stand, doesn't stand for the um, digital restriction management this time, so that's the direct uh, rendering manager. And that's an API that mostly originated from the GPU side uh, when people wanted to have 3D acceleration and have a kernel API to handle that. So DRM handles mostly memory management. Um, there's a bit of handling of uh, vertical blanking and synchronizing the rendering of the screen uh, with uh, the images that are being sent to the display. Uh, there's a couple of other, other features that are implemented there, uh, such as versioning of the API, so kind of user space can find out which version it can implement, uh, handling authentication of user space processes, because you don't want to have any raw user space process opening the device and being able to get access to the, uh, to the video buffers and being able to, uh, to access the screen. Um, that's also the concept of... Uh, mastering of a device, so the first, uh, the, the first application that's going to open the device will be considered as a master, will be able to give master permissions to other applications. So all that is things I implement in the RM API. Uh, then one really big topic of what we're going to talk today. Uh, today we'll mostly discuss the other part, which is the KMS API. And KMS is really a second API that got added to DRM um, when people were getting tired of having the whole setup of the graphics, uh, graphics pipeline and setting up of the mode, having that in user space in the, in the X server. Uh, there are a couple of issues with that, quite big issues actually. One of them is that X was poking directly on the hardware registers and especially the PCI register of the graphics card. That required having root access, and it also meant that if there was an issue, any, any bug in user space, uh, it could directly affect the stability of the system. So that's, that was really not a good model. <clears throat> and at that time, the graphics developer and the kernel decided to create a kernel API so that the whole handling of the hardware would be inside the kernel, as usual in Linux, and exposing an API to do mode setting uh, in user space. So the KMS API, kernel mode setting, is really about modeling the device and exposing a model of the device to the applications, uh, about handling the frame buffers, about handling the modes, that's kernel mode setting, so you need to, to be able to set the modes, and a couple of operations uh, that are related to that. Um, one of them that's important to understand is the page flip operation, uh, which is basically taking a new frame buffer and sending that out to the screen. So you flip from one frame buffer to a second one. We'll go back to that a bit later. Things like planes, uh, they're also called overlay uh, when, um, when talking about graphics, but in KMS term, that's uh, planes. Uh, handling of the cursor, which can be hard accelerated as well. Uh, and everything that's basically related to the mode and being able to set the mode and switch between buffers. So the device model in the chemist terms splits the hardware in three parts. We have one on the leftmost side, we have memory. That's obviously outside of the scope of the, of the graphics hardware. But that's 
the interface between uh, the, the the system and and uh, and the graphics hardware. So, and, uh, and the, the green blocks are just memory buffers that contain images and then can be scanned out to to the display. So the scan out process is something that is being done by a component called the CRTC. That's a pretty bad name. Uh, it means CRT controller, so cathode ray tube controller. Uh, there's not a lot of cathode ray tubes used anymore in graphics today, but still the name just stuck there. So you can think of the CRTC as a piece of hardware that is able to read from memory. It will read at least one frame buffer, possibly several of them, and compose that, and get that out to a physical bus. And the physical bus usually is internal to the device and is sent to one or multiple encoders. So an encoder is another piece of, hard of hardware that will translate between one specific uh, hardware bus to a different one. A uh, good example of that is that the CRTC will usually give you uh, RGB pixels that are being just sent on a bus and you want to connect that to an HDMI display or to DisplayPort or to VGA possibly using analog signals. So the encoder is really a piece of hardware that, that will do that. And the last piece of, um, of hardware that is mo being modeled by KMS is the connector. So that's the output of the pipeline and that's where you will plug uh, your monitor. Uh, the monitor itself is actually outside of the scope of KMS. So whatever you plug there is not directly modeled there, uh, but there's provision at the connector level to be able to interact with the display. So you can read, for instance, if you plug an HDMI display, you can read back the EDID of the, of the monitor to be able to, uh, to get the model name and to know what's supported by the hardware. So that's the other interface of the, of the device towards the, the display in that, uh, in that case. If you look at the device model for embedded systems, that's what I, uh, I mainly focus on in my, uh, in my kernel development for graphics drivers. Uh, it's split in three parts. So I've already mentioned that buffer is, uh, the, the buffers and memory is outside of the graphics hardware itself. And then the CRTC is uh, something that is always inside uh, the, um, the, the main processor in the, in the case of embedded devices. So you have an SOC um, and you have lots of IP cards around that. And um, the display engine of the SOC always includes this, the CRTC. Encoders can also be bundled inside. So you could have um, a display engine that bundles CRTC in one or multiple encoders. Uh, or they can be outside of the chip and on the board. So the two models are supported there. And the connectors, obviously, if you have an HDMI connector, that's not part of your chip. On the, it's always a component that's off chip and on the board. Um, Talk briefly about the scanner process. That's really simple. There's no black magic there. It's reading the frame buffer from memory, one pixel or multiple pixels at a time, and just scanning that out and sending out to a uh, to physical bus. So that's really the, the interface between memory on one side and something that's physical uh, on the other side. Uh, in KMS, at the, the scanner stage, in the CRTC, you can also perform composition. So composition is the fact, the, the act of taking multiple frame buffers, uh, possibly with scaling. Uh, rotation is possible as well. So there's a couple of processing. There's not a lot of processing that can be done, uh, but there's uh, mainly scaling composition and uh, there's gamma tables available as well. So it's not a full-fledged image processor. Uh, and then you compose that to the screen on a single output. So that means that if you have multiple planes, multiple frame buffers, they overlay on top of each other. And depending on the, uh, the capabilities of the hardware composer, uh, you can handle, for instance, alpha blending if you want transparency. Um, that's really up to the hardware. So KMS models all that and support all those operations, um, <clears throat> meaning that an application that uses the KMS API doesn't have to know exactly what the hardware is, uh, is capable of. The, the capabilities will be reported. For instance, the number of plays and planes, the number of overlays, kind of things will be reported. And the application will be able to use, through a single API, all those features. So there's no 3D acceleration through the KMS API. It's really about graphics. It's, not, it's graphics and display. It's not about uh, rendering. This, the rendering API, that's for the GPU side. It's not part of the display engine. So we won't talk about the GPU.
Um, so I mentioned that the, the composition and the scan out take pixels from memory and from a frame buffer. Uh, and the frame buffer is also now something that is modeled by KMS. So the, usually we think of the frame buffer as a piece of memory in which you store pixels. In the case of KMS, it's slightly more complex than that. Um, <laughs> pixels can be stored in a single piece of memory, indeed. You could have RGB pixels stored there with one byte for red, uh, green, and blue. But depending on the format, uh, several pieces of the image could be stored in several pieces of memory, several separate pieces of memory. So the frame buffer is an abstract object in KMS terms that will group one or more memory buffers and attach to them a couple of properties. So we have a size, we have a width and an eighth. Uh, we have a format. And we have a couple of other properties, uh, the pitches and offsets that allow you to specify uh, how the pixels are formatted in memory. So you could have a line that is in actually physically longer in memory than the number of pixels that need to be stored there. So you could have padding at the end of the line. So the, um, the frame buffer object is flexible enough to be able to, mod to model all that. The memory buffers that are inside that compose the, 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 the frame buffer also modeled by, by KMS. And there's a bit of overlap there with the DRM API. So I mentioned a DRM that's mostly for the 3D acceleration and for the GPU, but it also handles the memory allocation. Uh, so those objects, uh, which we call uh, GAM objects in DRM and KMS terms, those are really pieces of memory. And they also contain a couple of properties. Uh, again, with eight bits per pixel, the pitch, the size of the, of the memory, but that's a single memory buffer. So there's nothing really, uh, really complex about that. GAM stands for the Graphic Execution Manager. That's one of the memory managers that was implemented for 3D acceleration. Uh, there's well, a couple of uh, competing ones. That's today the one that is dominating uh, and that is used when you want to allocate buffers just for display that are not used for th uh, 3D rendering. Um, those buffers can be, that's also through the RMBPI, they can be shared. Yep. Uh, graphic ex Execution Manager, if I remember correctly. Yeah, those, we would use a different name today because it's really a memory locator and memory manager. Uh, because it came through 3D world, there was concept of graphic execution at that time and the rendering pipelines. So that's, that's where it, it came from. A bit like the CRTC controller, we wouldn't name it like that today. Um, one really key part of the DRM API is that it's uh, able to share the buffers between different processes and actually between different, different devices as well. And that's extremely important when you want to avoid copying uh, data from one memory buffer to another memory buffer. So you have, if you have a buffer to uh, which you have rendered uh, an image using your GPU, you don't want to copy that to a frame buffer and then scan that out to the screen. Uh, copying a 1080p image at 60 frames per second, that would be extremely expensive and you wouldn't be able to, uh, to achieve good performances. So zero copy is really a target that we want to achieve uh, when we do graphics. And sharing of buffers is something that is needed for that. So how does sh buffer sharing work? Well, when you create a buffer, uh, game object, then you will get a local handle. So in user space, you get a number, you create a buffer, and kernel tells you, okay, number, the, the buffer is number, number five. So you can use that local handle when you refer to the buffer. Obviously, if you want to share the buffer and just give number five to another process, another device, that could refer to something completely different. So we don't want to do that. Um, instead, you ask the kernel driver, okay, I have the buffer number five, that's my buffer, and I want to share it with someone else. So can you please give me a global handle that can be shared? Um, that's part of the DRM API. So you get a global handle, and the global handle is today a file descriptor. It used to be just a 32-bit integer, uh, but that's a solution that's not secure, because if you have another process that can guess the 32-bit integer, it can just get access to the buffer without any knowledge of the first process. So that allows applications or rogue applications to try to get access to the content of the screen. Uh, people who uh, render multimedia don't like that. Personally, don't care too much, but that's not the point. Uh, but you also don't want an application to be able to render like 
um, override the, the content of the screen with a password dialog box that would look exactly like your login dialog box to capture your password, for instance. So there's lots of security issues with that. So you want to make sure that buffer sharing is actually um, something that you do explicitly, that an application cannot get access to buffer if it's not allowed. When you get a file descriptor and you use a base application, that's also a number. And if you give that number to another application, that will not refer to the same file. So that's not going to work. But in Linux, this provision for passing a file descriptor, it's not um, limited to, to DRM or KMS. When you have a file descriptor in user space that refers to an open file, you can use a, <coughs> you can use a Unix socket on the system and pass with special API the file descriptor to another application that will receive the file descriptor on the other side. We'll likely have a different number, but that's going to refer to the same file. So we actively use that, and when the second process receives the file descriptor, then it can go back to the kernel, say, I have this global handle, please give me a local handle I can use, and then the process can get back to the local handle and use the buffer. So the same buffer will, can be shared between applications, and similarly can also be shared between devices if you take the, 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 the handle and pass it to a different driver. I mentioned that KMS handles modes. So a mode is... Pretty, uh, pretty simple. That's an active area on the screen. So you want to have the size of the active area on the screen. But you want also to know how much blanking you have. So there's um, an area before the line start and after the line starts and before the image starts and after the image starts uh, that contains nothing. And that's related to the timing. So there's, in video timings terms, you have a synchronization pulse at the beginning of each line. Then you have an area where there's no content, you have your active content, and finally you have an inactive area, and then the last answer again, and you have the same thing vertically. Um, that's how a mode is, uh, is encoded today. So you have that information on the vertical side, that's four numbers for the timings, and some information on the horizon, uh, horizontal side. Whether we refer to the to the size. Not sure if we can see a laser pointer on the screen. Probably not. Okay. Whether we refer to the size as the size of the sync pulse and then the size of all the areas, or whether we give numbers that correspond to different uh, length, that's just a matter of encoding the information. It doesn't matter too much. But uh, in uh, in KMS, the modes are referred to as the dis the active display size. Uh, the point at which the synchronization pulse will start, the point at which it will end, and the total, uh, the to total size. Doing it that way uh, ensures that uh, basically through the API you cannot pass uh, information that, uh, that is invalid and will not be, uh, be understood by the kernel. When it comes to mode setting, uh, the, the API in KMS is quite simple as well. So you give a frame buffer that will be scanned by the CRTC. Uh, to a number of connectors with a given mode. So you pass a structure with all that information. Uh, you can also pass offsets inside a frame buffer in uh, two directions. And then that single call to the kernel will configure the whole display and will start displaying what the content of the frame buffer. <laughs> I mentioned page flipping. So you can do that to uh, flip to a different page, a different frame buffer uh, on a plane. So again, you will pass uh, the new frame buffer that you want. Uh, you will pass the CRTC on, uh, on which you want to, uh, to display it. Uh, actually, not the number of connectors on that one. I have to remove that. And that's just going to switch to new frame buffer. So that's the, uh, the API that was used until quite recently, I would say, till a year ago, that was, uh, that was the main API. But there's an issue with that. Using page flipping, you can flip a single page at a time, meaning that if you have multiple planes or multiple overlays on the screen, you cannot change all of them atomically in a single go. One typical use case of the overlays is, for instance, to display a video. So you have one overlay that shows a video, and your main frame buffer behind that shows a desktop, and the window that's around the video. So you have the window decoration. When you move the window across the screen, if you don't synchronize the main frame buffer and the overlay with the, the video, then you can have the video that will move before, maybe one frame before, uh, the decoration of the window moves. So that will not look good on the screen. 
And to solve that, we have developed a new API that's called the Atomic Update API, and that's really going to be the main, the main focus of uh, what I'm going to talk to, uh, about today. And the idea of the Atomic Update API is that you can change everything about the device. You can reconfigure the device completely in a single IOCTL, a single call to the kernel. And the way we do that is that all the properties that you want to change, we express them as, well, properties. And we have a big set of properties. It's basically a list uh, with IDs and values that is passed to the kernel in a single go. And based on that, the kernel will construct a, a view of the device state. So it's the whole device and the state of the whole device, which is split in the state of the, the planes, the CRTCs, and the connectors internally. Um, and that state will then be used by the driver to reconfigure the device. So it's two steps. First, use a space constructs a list of properties that it wants to change, passes that to the kernel. Uh, the kernel will create the state from that and will then let the driver apply the state. So there's two operations there. There's an atomic check operation that ensures that the state invalid is valid. Otherwise, if you use space, try to do something that's invalid, then you will go back and say, no, you can't do that. That's not a valid configuration. And then there's the atomic commit operation that is used to apply the state in a single go atomically. Um, for the atomic update, as I mentioned, we have a structure that contains basically a list of objects and, and a list of properties. So for, we have prop, uh, properties that refer to an object, uh, and it's just a big list. You can change a single property, uh, or you can change all of them in a single go. There's documentation that's available um, in the kernel. The first one, that's kernel docs, that's the comments in the, in the source code. It was quite in existence a couple of years ago uh, when I started working on that. Now we have much better documentation. Uh, Intel worked a lot on that. They actually even um, contracted someone uh, to uh, enhance the kernel doc tools so that we can write better documentation. Uh, and there's also doc book documentation in the kernel. So it's quite extensive. There's no way to complete. Uh, but still, it's much better than a couple of uh, a few years ago. And the best way to uh, make it even better is if you start working on graphics and you can contribute to the documentation. That's actually how I started doing it. There was no documentation. I had to read the code. And I thought it was so painful that I would write something for the next person. I had to do it for, for myself anyway. Uh, I'm going to show you code. I know that's always boring. And well, I hope you're a bit familiar with programming, all of you. Otherwise, the next part of the talk will be a bit, a bit difficult to follow. Um, there's no error handling in the code, because that would just mean way too many lines of code on the screen, and you wouldn't be able to read that. There's no locking either for the same reason. So don't try this at home. That's going to crash. That's never going to work. You have to add the proper locking and, uh, and error handling. But I just want to show you the overall structure of a driver, of a graphics driver, that implements the Atomic API. Um, every function, a structure that starts with DRM underscore, that's part of the DRM call. It's not part of the driver. So that's something that's standard. Uh, every function, uh, I took one driver I wrote as an example here. So every function, a structure that will start with R car DU, or don't have a DRM pre uh, prefix, that's going to be part of the driver. So let's dive directly in. <laughs> A driver starts with a probe function that has been called where the device is detected and bound with the driver. And that function will allocate a DRM device ob object. Uh, that's a pretty simple step. You do that at the beginning of your pro probe function, uh, and you pass it a pointer to your physical device, and you also pass it a pointer to a big structure with lots of function pointers. And that's going to be how the driver implements the API and communicates with the DRM call. Um, a couple of things that the driver needs to do in the probe function. It will need to allocate, also allocate a structure with its own, to store its own information. So the DRM device is about the DRM car, all the information needed by the DRM car for the device. And the driver will need private information, so it will need to allocate that. It will need to um, <coughs> initialize memory management, get the clocks it needs, the, regular, the, uh, the voltage regulators, the interrupts, all that. And then finally, when everything is set up, the driver will register the device, and at that point, the device will be available in user space. Uh, 
Uh, the other way around, when the device is removed, uh, meaning hot pluggable device can be removed, but you can also uh, unbuy the device from a driver, then you need to first unregister the device, so it will not be available to use space anymore, do all the cleanup you need, and once the cleanup is done, then you call the uh, DRM dev unref that will uh, decrease the reference count to the device, and when all the refer references have disappeared, everything will be, uh, will be destroyed. Okay, maybe someone is reminding me that I have a talk to give right now. <laughs> Let me put that in silence. Um, so let's dive in the DRM driver structure. As I mentioned, there's lots of function pointers, a bit of information there. What I highlighted there is the features that you need, uh, you need to specify. So the feature, that's a list of features that you, you driver support has been expanded over time. There's lots of legacy features that you don't need. So a driver today will most likely need to say I have interrupts that I need to use. Uh, we'll need to say I use GAM as my memory manager. You could use another one, but you would need an extremely good reason to do that. Uh, say I can do kernel mode setting. Uh, we still have drivers that still do user space mode setting. That's really legacy. Nobody should do that anymore. The driver can do also prime is a code name that means buffer sharing between uh, between applications. You want to do that too. And finally, the driver atomic flag says yes, I support the atomic update operations. All the new drivers that all the new graphics driver that are committed today need to support that. There's a couple of other information. Uh, some can be a bit useful, other are, in my opinion, totally useless. So someone decided it would be good to have the version of the driver encoding that structure and to have a date as well. So that driver was written to the 2013, and if you look at the mainline kernel today, it's still the same day and it's still the 1.0 version, because that has never been updated. Uh, that's a bit pointless, but it's there today. So if you want to set any funny date in there, it's actually a string, so it doesn't even have to be a date. So if you want to just make fun of the developers who uh, decided to do that and put any message in there, uh, fine with me. Um, next step is to define the file operations. So that's the operations that are directly accessible from user space. And you don't want to implement those operations yourself. There could be exceptions when you want to override them, and that's allowed. But if you look at the file operation structure that the driver has to define and has to reference into in the DRM driver, uh, there's well the usual file operations. And all of them are implemented with DRM helpers. So everything that's out with DRM underscores that the helper functions from the DRM call, there's not a single one that I have over, uh, overridden in my driver. So you can just use the helper functions, and that's it. You don't have to do anything else. Um, Next step, I mentioned you probably need uh, an interrupt. Uh, so in that case, we have a couple of helpers as well that can be used to, uh, to get the interrupt and register the interrupt handler. Uh, so there's the DRM IQ install function that does that. Uh, and you specify in DRM driver the, uh, the interrupt handling function. That only works if your device uses a single interrupt. If you have multiple interrupts that you want to use, then you need to do it explicitly and not through the helper. But that's not extreme, extremely difficult. Next thing to set up is the mode configuration. So there's a bit of information that the DRAM core needs. Uh, it needs to know the minimum and maximum mode size of the, the frame buffers you will, you will be able to support and of the, of the mode that you can support. So usually it's hard coded to, well, the biggest size that the, the hardware can support. There's no black mag magic in there. And there's also a pointer to a structure that has Again, function pointers. So there's, there's lots of uh, helper functions in DRM core that are not mandatory to use. Uh, and we have lots of function pointers that we can use to either plug our own implementation or use the helpers. Usually, you will use the helpers for most other things, but they will point out why it's different. There's the FB create helper. That's a function you need to implement. And that's, uh, that's an operation that will create a frame buffer. Um, the, the reason you want to implement that yourself is that devices usually have restrictions on what they can do, uh, give the size of frame buffer, but also the alignment in memory. So you want to uh, make sure that you create something that's actually usable by the device. 
Uh, I mentioned memory allocation. There's nothing uh, big that needs to be done there. Again, you don't want to roll out your own implementation. So there's one that's based on the DMA memory allocation in the kernel, uh, and that's the DRM game CMA uh, helpers. So you plug in the uh, Veeam operations that are in the, in the DRM card, the function to free the objects, the function to map the memory to user space, um, all that you need to reuse. If you have really specific needs, you might want to override that, but on, for embedded devices, most of them don't need to do that. So if you just need a memory that's physically contiguous for your device, use that, you're fine. Um, and there's a concept of, in game of dumb objects. Um, not that the other ones are really more clever, but the game API is able to allocate memory buffers and to manage the memory buffers. But actually allocation uh, was thought to be something really device specific because you have lots of device specific requirements. So when the, KMS, the, the DRM API was created, uh, people decided that actual allocation of the buffer should be something that's device specific. So you have a device specific AO control that is used to create the buffer. And that's not really convenient. If you want to have an application user space uh, that doesn't use any hardware acceleration, no GPU, nothing. Like you want at the start of the system to display a, uh, a logo, uh, an image when you boot. That's all, when, all you want to do. You don't want in that application to uh, have explicit support for all the drivers, all the different drivers you have in the kernel. And so for that reason, they also decided to create a, an, an API that can be, that is a standard API, uh, usable to allocate dumb buffers. And a dumb buffer is a buffer that can be used to be scanned out of the screen, uh, or, or to the screen. So you can write, uh, applications can write an image to that buffer and display that on the screen, but cannot be used for 3D acceleration. So if you have a GPU, you'll need to allocate memory specifically for the GPU. But if you just want to have a frame buffer that you want to display and no 3D rendering to that, then you can use the dumb API. So that's the, the standard API we have. And again, helper functions, no need to override them. Buffer sharing, prime, same thing. Uh, helper functions, reuse them, that's it. Coming to the frame buffer, so I mentioned the FB create function. Uh, and I said that the reason you want to override that is to validate actually the, the, the parameters and, and that you get from user space. So you're gonna validate the pixel format to make sure you can support that. You're gonna validate the size. Uh, and then if you can't support it, you just return an error. Otherwise, help a function to create the buffer, you don't. Now we're coming to the CRTC encoder and, and connector. So those are Inside, uh, are objects that correspond to hardware pieces and that need, to be, that need to be configured. So you first need to create them. When you initialize your driver and the probe function, you need to create at least one CRTC, at least one encoder, at least one connector. Uh, if you don't have a connector, it's a bit pointless to have a display engine. So creating a CRTC, you call the DRM CRTC init function. That's gonna initialize the CRTC structure. Uh, and you give it, again, function pointers to handle the CRTC operation. And the one that's displayed here is the one that is used when the CRTC is destroyed. And again, helper function, you don't. Connector, same thing. You create the, you initialize the connector, uh, the encoder, sorry, the, the, the encoder with DRM encoder in it. Uh, you pass it a bit more parameters. So you tell the encoder on which CRTC can be used. And you tell it the, the, the function also what type of encoder you have. So in this case, that's a digital to analog uh, converter. So that's basically a VGA encoder. Uh, but there's a couple of types as you put in the kernel. Destroying it, cleanup function, that's it. Uh, connector, a bit more information. So you actually need to give the size of the display that is being attached. It can be done there if you know it uh, at initialization time. Can be done later if you actually support hot pluggable connect, uh, hot pluggable monitors. Uh, I mentioned the connector is something to which you can plug a monitor, but it's also used to model a panel. Uh, so if you have an embedded device with a fixed panel, that's modeled by a connector, and in that case, you know the information beforehand. Then you initialize the connector, and for the connector, uh, you actually, actually need to initialize and register it in two separate uh, steps, uh, but for historical reasons. And then you, you, attach, you attach the connector to an encoder, 
clean <coughs> this dryer you call the clean up helper and that's it. So with those three, uh, three steps, you have created your CRTCs, encoders, connectors, and all that will be visible, visible from user space, uh, and user space will be able to interact with them. Last thing we need to initialize, that's the planes. Uh, so the planes, the overlays, uh, you need to initialize all of them. So you can have, you need at least one plane. Because if you can't read from memory, it's a bit difficult to display anything. Um, so at least one plane, and it needs to be flagged as a primary plane. And then you can have any number from zero to, I'm not sure if there's a limit, uh, overlay planes. And for the planes, you define a list of formats that can be supported on the plane. So I can read RGB, I can read YUV from memory in this, uh, in this particular format. Uh, and uh, you also need to specify the, the list of CRTCs on which you can uh, you can connect the plane. So that's just initializing it. Uh, destroy cleanup cleanup function again. Uh, so when you have that, you have cre created all the pieces that need to be exposed to user space. Now, if we look inside the driver, because so far they're created, but they can't do anything. The first thing that needs to be implemented is the mode discovery. So you connect a monitor to your connector, and you have a panel with a fixed resolution. Uh, so on each connector, you need to implement a field modes function. And the field modes function uh, is just going to return the list of modes that can be supported in a particular connector for the monitor that's plugged in there. You could retrieve that through EDID if it's an HDMI monitor. You could have a hard-coded list if you know what panel is connected. You could use any method you want, but that's specific to the driver to implement. Um, so the field modes can also be implemented using a helper function. In which case, you need to supply two more operation handlers. So field mode can be a bit big, so the, the helper splits it in two smaller, uh, smaller functions. The first one is get mode that will return the, all modes that can be supported in the display. Then the DRM car is going to add a couple of standard resolutions as well to that. And then there's the mode valid operation that you need to implement to tell whether a particular mode is valid. Because user space can also set a mode that you haven't reported. Uh, so user space can set custom modes, and you need to tell whether, whether they're valid or not. Uh, so with that, we have initialized the device. We know what modes it can support. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, for the Atomic Update API, the goal is to create a state of the device and then be able to commit that state to the, to the hardware. So the state is split in several pieces. Uh, the CRTC state uh, contains well lots of information. Uh, so just a couple of fields there, whether the CRTC is actually enabled or not, whether the mode has changed since the last time, but things like that. And to handle the state, you need to supply three operations. You need to be able to reset the state. Resetting means resetting either to a default or possibly reading it back from the hardware. And that's used for fast boot operations. You, you have your bootloader, an embedded device that displays an image on the screen and you're booting into Linux kernel. And you want to keep that boot screen until you can actually switch to an application, for instance. Uh, currently, most uh, drivers don't support that, and it will just reset the graphics device, at which point you could actually show the boot logo again, but there's going to be a black screen for maybe a second, half a second, two seconds. But if you implement the reset operation in a way that it reads back the state of the hardware to figure out, OK, I've been programmed to do this, to output this mode with this frame buffer that's located in the memory, uh, then you can get rid of that blank state of the screen and just go on with the boot and get back the configuration from the bootloader and, and keep going. If you don't want to do that in your first implementation, or if you don't want to support that feature, then the reset function will just, well, basically reset the uh, reset the state. Uh, if you just want to reset the state, there's a helper function that you can use, that's it. Two other functions, one to duplicate an existing state, so there's a state object, and when you want to create a new state and apply that new state, you're going to start by duplicating the current state and then modifying it. Uh, and uh, the DRM call doesn't know how to duplicate a state, uh, because the state is something that you can actually uh, build on and expand yourself. If you don't do that, you can use helper function to duplicate and destroy the state. So in my driver, I haven't extended the CRTC state, so I just use the helper functions. For the connector, same thing. You have a connector state, you have a reset, duplicate state, destroy state handlers, use the helper functions, you don't. 
you also have state for the planes. In my case, uh, I actually needed to extend uh, the plane state. So there's a couple of information that are part of the standard plane state, but I also have a plane state that's uh, specific to my device. So it's on the first line, you can see that it embeds the DRAM plane state, and I have additional fields. And for that reason, I have to implement the reset, the duplicate, and the destroy functions. So I don't support reading back the hardware state. So what reset is going to do is that if there's currently a state uh, that's set for the device, it's going to destroy it, first operation. It's going to allocate a new state, second operation, fill that with information, and then set it as the active state of the device. So resetting is just that. If you want to read back from the hardware, you have to construct the content of the state from the, from the register that you read. So that can be actually a bit of complex operation. But if you really want to support fast boot and keeping the, the image on the display, you have to do that. Uh, to my knowledge, it's only the uh, Intel i915 driver that supports that today. Uh, next operation, duplicating a state. Well, I do a KMM dub, so duplicate the, the object, and then call a helper function to duplicate the part of the state that is uh, standard. Because there are fields there, there are pointers in there, that point to reference counted objects. You need to keep the reference count correct. You don't want to do that yourself. So for the part that you don't own, you just use the helper function. That's it, and return the copy of the state. Destroying, same thing, uh, calling the destroy helper for the standard part, and then do a K free. So freeing the memory for the overall state object. So state manipulation is not difficult. Uh, either use the helper functions directly if you don't subclass the state. If you do subclass it, implement three operations, use the helper, and just add a bit uh, of, uh, of code specific to the to state implementation. Um, there's a couple of helper functions as well uh, to set pointers inside the state structures. I mentioned that things are reference counted. So in the, a plane, for instance, is atta attached to a CRTC. So in the plane state, there's a pointer to the CRTC. Don't set the pointer directly because that's reference counted. Always use helper functions to do that, and the DRM core is going to handle that for you. Um, now comes the atomic update itself. We have constructed a state, and we need to apply the state to the hardware. And for that, there's only two operations that the driver needs to implement. That's the atomic check. Is the state valid? Can I use that? If not, going to return an error to use space. And then, if it's valid, there's the atomic commit, commit operation that's going to apply the state. Atomic commit is not allowed to fail. So once you say the state is valid, you expect it to be able to apply it to the device. And that's it. There's no, uh, no full back path there. You can't say, no, actually, I can do it. So you have to make sure in the check function that all the error cases are properly tested. Um, there's two helper functions, again, that can be used to implement that because Actually checking the content of the state and applying it, committing it, is really a large operation. So there's two helper functions that can be used to split uh, the check and commit in smaller steps. And to use them, you need to uh, enable a set of helpers on the CRTC connector and encoder. Say, so saying, I want to use the DRM atomic helper check and DRM atomic helper commit functions uh, as my atomic check and atomic commit handlers. And then I'm going to use sub-handlers that are specified as you set pointers to the structures with the, the small handlers. Uh, on the CRTC side, you have to implement at least three functions, one of which is called mode, mode fix up. That's used for the check. So it's, the CRTC will be given a mode with given a resolution. And will say, yes, I can use that. No, I cannot use that. Or maybe, yes, I can do, use it, but I'm going to modify, for instance, the pixel block slightly because the refresh rate that has, uh, has been asked by the application is something I can, cannot achieve exactly. So you can fix up a mode like that. And then enable and disable. So that's really two simple operations. You're going to disable the hardware, enable the hardware, and when you enable, you're going to program all that. There's an optional operation called mode set no FB that will actually apply the mode to the resolution, but you can do that in the enable handler if you want to. So just three functions to implement. Um, on, the on the encoder, there's one more. So enable, disable again. There's the atomic check. That's going to check whether uh, a mode is supported. And there's a mode set that will configure the encoder and set the mode. 
for the connector, there's a single function that's needed. That's the atomic best encoder uh, that will return the best encoder to be connected to that, to that connector. So you have a connector at the end of the pipeline. Maybe it can uh, be connected to multiple encoders. You have to pick the one that the driver thinks is the best. So that's the, the only one you need. Uh, there's another one that was used before the atomic update. It's still used if you want to implement support for FB dev emulation because the KMS support emulating the FB dev API. But that's getting really, really deprecated. Uh, there's an email that was sent about a week ago by the FB dev maintainer who said, please, no new FB dev drivers. So that means that, well, you will hopefully not commit new FB dev drivers. So we moving. Uh, I, I called for deprecating FB dev about two years ago, and it's finally going to happen. So that's really the, really the way to go. Um, still on the atomic update. When you want to configure the plane, so we saw how to uh, configure the encoder and how to configure the CRTC for the mode. When it comes to configuring the plane, so knowing where to get the pixel from memory, there's two functions at the CRTC level called begin and flush. So begin is called before any plane is configured, flush when all of them have been configured. And that's where you will implement the transactional part of the API. If you want to do multiple page flips in one go, you will make sure usually using harder features that will be actually done in one go. So in the begin handler, what you will actually usually do is to freeze modifications uh, at the hardware level. Then you're going to set up all the planes. We'll see in a second how to do that. And then in the flush handler, you're going to unfreeze. So usually the hardware will have go bit that you can set and that will be used to trigger uh, the update of all the configuration. What is also done in the atomic begin function is to enabling V-blank processing, so enabling the vertical blanking interrupt, because we need to synchronize page flipping usually to vertical blanking, uh, so you enable the interrupt processing uh, at, uh, at that point. On the plain side, uh, there's a couple of uh, functions of operations that you need to implement. There's a prepar FB and cleanup FB operations that are used to prepare, prepare and clean up a frame buffer. Uh, the most common use for that for preparation is uh, when you want to actually pin a frame buffer to memory. So you have a piece uh, of memory, uh, you have frame buffer that is, has been allocated, but maybe all the pages uh, that back the memory haven't been allocated yet. Maybe use delayed allocation. So you want to make sure in pre prepare FB that the memory is actually there and it will not be freed behind your back because while you're scanning out pixels from the memory, if it's freed at that time uh, because there's a lot of pressure in the system, for instance, that's not going to work. The purpose of prepare FB and clean up FB does the opposite thing. Uh, and then actually doing the update, well, there's two operations you need to implement. Atomic check is called that check time to make sure that the configuration is valid for the plane. And atomic update will update the state of the hardware for a single plane. So there's going to be an atomic begin call at the CRTC level, one or multiple atomic update calls, and then one atomic flush to uh, flush the, the hardware. The atomic disable, that's an optional operation. If it's not implemented, you will get an atomic update call even for planes that are being disabled. If it's implemented, you will get it for only, we'll get update only for the planes that are being enabled and the disabled call for the other ones. Um, really quickly go through vertical blanking, uh, which I mentioned before. You need to initialize vertical blanking handling uh, when you uh, when you load uh, the, the driver, you need to uh, handle the v-blank event in your interrupt handler when you have an interrupt that arrives because it's vertical blanking time, uh, and you need to implement two functions to enable the interrupt, disable the interrupt. That's it. Um, no, actually, in the interrupt handler, you also usually want to uh, finish the page flip. Uh, so that means that it's a driver-specific function uh, that will send an event to user space to say, yes, the, the update that you wanted to do, it's complete now. Yeah. Uh, because the update can be asynchronous, so the user space will get control back as soon as the update has been queued, but needs to be notified when the update is finished. If you want support for the legacy API, you wire up three uh, operations, that's it. All the Atomic KMS API is supported on top of the Atomic update. Nothing else. Uh, 
Things I haven't mentioned. Uh, I mentioned properties as the way to convey information between use space and kernel space and to set up all the, 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 um, the device state. But you can also create custom properties to set things that are not standard, like uh, if, you, uh, if your buffer can be uh, mirrored, for instance, I don't think we have mirrored properties, uh, the display can be mir mirrored if you, if you support half alpha blending, things like that. There's no standard properties for many of those, so you can create extended ones. I haven't mentioned connector status poll, but there's an API you need to implement to actually uh, being notified of a hot plug of a monitor. Uh, FB defamilation, which I briefly mentioned, but didn't go in too much detail. That's something that's handled by the car, but you, well, it's there today, it can be disabled, and it's going to be disabled in the future at some point. So that's not something you space need to rely on. So that's pretty much what we have today. Uh, there's ongoing work being done for next kernel version on suspend and resume helper. Uh, on having the uh, FB defamilation on top of the atomic update, uh, on being able to, uh, so currently you get update notifications for everything, even for the planes that will not be displayed, uh, which is not that useful. There are drivers that have difficulties coping with that, so there's more code that's needed in driver to track that kind of state. Uh, that's going to be handled by the car and a better runtime PM support. I know that Kevin will be happy about that, yeah. <laughs> Future, there's a lot of work to be done there. We need to totally rework the V-blank handling because it's a mess and nobody understands the code, which is pretty bad. Uh, we have two competing um, frameworks for slaves that are outside of the chip. We want to merge them in a single one. We want to support write back, so instead of displaying to memory, actually capture the, dis the, the, the output in memory. Uh, we want to support live sources, which means that instead of getting uh, images from memory, we get them from another piece of hardware. Um, we want to have proper support for fences, so that's basically barriers that can be used to queue multiple work at the same time, but only start to work when all the dependencies have finished. That's extremely useful when you have a GPU and a display controller, and when you want to make sure that you don't start displaying the buffer before the GPU has finished rendering to it. So the support for that was the standard in the standard support in the DRAM car is not good enough. Uh, lots of work on validation. So Intel is working on validation tools that can be used to test the driver from user space uh, because we have more and more drivers being being committed and they all have all kinds of different bugs. So you want to be able to catch that. A fast boot that I mentioned through the reset handlers uh, and the generic asynchronous commit. So the commit operation can be synchronous or asynchronous depending on what user space wants. And the generic implementation, the RAM car is only synchronous. So if you want asynchronous today, you need to roll out your own implementation. So working on a generic one. I know I'm out of time, so just a couple of resources, uh, blog posts, articles, documentation that could be useful. Contact information, well, mostly the DRL, DRI devil mailing list. Uh, it's missing a dot between list and tree desktop. I will correct that. And hopefully we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yep. Oh, that's a good one. So common display framework is not really about the um, uh, user space API. It's more of an internal framework inside the kernel to model the display devices in a bit more generic fashion. Uh, and hopefully extended that, extending that to uh, uh, capture devices too. So it's quite separate. Uh, KMS is more about user space interface. Yes? Uh, the C Okay, so it's actually uh, badly named. So CMA is the contiguous memory allocator. So it's a framework inside the kernel that can be used to allocate physically contiguous memory. But the CMA helper actually doesn't use CMA. It uses the DMA API, the DMA memory allocation API in the kernel, which can use CMA internally or can use other methods depending on what is available. So even though they call the CMA helpers, they're not tied to CMA. You can use them without CMA. Uh, but given that they use the DMA memory allocation, the DMA memory allocation API, then they are using system memory. So you have custom memory, then you need uh, you need different uh, different implementation. Any more questions?
and what kind of chip I have developed. Uh, so my first driver was the driver for Renesus, which is a Japanese company. Um, it's mostly used in the automotive market, so it's an ARM32 SoC. Uh, I actually wrote two drivers for them because they decided to totally change the display controller between two generations of chips. Uh, and then I'm working on the TI OMAP DRM driver as well. But it's, so it's embedded, it's not on desktop. Yep. Okay, help us for the ADID. So reading the ADID from the hardware, you have to do that yourself because that's hardware specific. But for passing the ADID, you have helpers in KMS and that can, you just pass the ADID blob uh, and it will return you a list of modes and extra information. So you don't have to do the passing yourself. Actually, the ADID passing is simple in theory, but in practice really complex because there are lots of bugs and lots of different monitors. They return wrong information, so there's lots of code in the helpers that actually try to deal with that and say, oh, that's a known issue with that monitor, so we're going to fix that. All right, thank you.